There is a child here. It's different. I'm catching myself every Sunday in awkward moments in worship going, why, did, why, why, are, you, why are you doing that? Not you, me. Why, saying to myself, why, why am I doing that? Why, why haven't I gone down to sit with the children during the children's message? I caught myself this morning going, why haven't you started doing that yet? We'll be there next week. I, I found myself going, why didn't you sit next to Catherine? Y- y'all sit next to each other in meetings five days a week. I think you can go sit next to her and worship, Derek. It's, it's all right. I find myself in these, in these awkward and weird moments. Catherine, uh, when they start to applaud, slow down, baby, slow down. Especially when they're applauding Sunday school teachers. It's different, isn't it? It's the room you've been coming to for decades. Decades, but it's different. The different will go away, I promise. I hope. It's different. Ministry is... Well, ministry is different no matter what. Ministry is just different. But it's been especially, especially different in this season, in this time. Kim came to me one day, I don't know, end of last summer. She said, Derek, there's people that are really uncomfortable with you wearing headphones on Sunday morning during worship. I did. I wore headphones pretty much all Sunday morning. If I wasn't preaching, I was wearing headphones. I was in headphones pretty much the whole time. Can I, could, can I tell you why? Can I confess to you why I was wearing headphones the, pretty much the entire morning? Because I hated preaching online. I hated it. Now, for those of you who are digitally with us this morning and virtually with us, we love you very, very much and very, very glad that you're here. This is my own personal experience. It doesn't mean it's not good. It doesn't mean it's not important. And please know that we are grateful for you. And for those of you who were with us throughout those 18 months online, I couldn't very well say, man, I hate doing this. Because you got to give a smiling face. But I hated it. And so I would turn the music on and I would try to control my heartbeat. I would try to control my head. I would try to bring the breathing down. Or sometimes I'd throw James Brown on and see if I could pick up the rhythm and try to find it. Because it's not the preaching necessarily that I love. It's the connecting. I love to make you laugh. It's a thing. I enjoy it. I'm a clown at the end of the day, but that's not it either. It's the sharing of the gospel. It's the sharing of the good news. It's the sharing of of God's word and God's love. And in those moments when we're together, where we're in this space together, and I know you're feeling it, I know the Holy Spirit's pouring into you, and I'm getting to be a conduit, and we're in these conversations, and you may not say a word, but you're communicating back to me, and we're We're dancing. That's, I love it. And those eyes back there, they don't dance. They don't even blink. It was hard. It was, it was hard. Ministry's weird and tough and awkward as it is. And that was just really, really awkward. Jen and I, about a month ago, three weeks ago, were in the car. We were going to a doctor's appointment and then heading back. And we got a great, great report, great, great, all clear, cancer, all clear, great. And I, just, and I said to her, I said, Let's, we should go to a health food restaurant. We should go to a healthy restaurant and get a healthy lunch. And she said, well, where were you thinking? I was like, well, there's this place called the OK Cafe. And they take all the unhealthy out of the country fried steak. They just rip it right out of there. (laughs) That wasn't our first time eating. She knew it was a setup. And as we're driving to the OK Cafe, which means I'm trying to get there as quickly as possible before she changes her mind, the Reverend Bruce Griffith calls. And he says, how's your morning going, Derek? He knew what we were doing and knew that we had gotten a good report. And he said, I've had a morning as well. Have you now? I figured it was going to involve something aggravating with Kristen Suddeth, but it wasn't that. He said, I was set up at Tillman this morning. I got up running. I got up going. I got everything running, and I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And then there was a 
a notification that someone was at the door. Have I mentioned that ministry is different? There was a notification. He knew that somebody was at the door, and he went to the door, and there standing at the door was a woman not wearing any clothes. Not some clothes, not a little bit of clothes, any clothes. He had our attention. And so Bruce at that point goes back inside, does what you're supposed to do, or I guess what you're supposed to do. I don't know what else you would have done. He calls 911. He calls the police. He calls the dispatcher to have them come out and help. He tells this lady, please put some clothes on. She begins to put clothes on. They ask the greatest question ever asked in the history of Smyrna, Georgia. Are you ready? They asked Bruce when he said there is a naked lady outside the building. They asked her, well, sir, can you please describe her? <laughs> I was ready to hear that explanation. I was ready to hear that. Well, she's naked. <laughs> there was a woman that had been missing since the night before that had been reported missing. So they had been looking for her, and they were wanting to know if she was going to fit the description. It was her. The police had already been out looking and were already close and nearby, and they got close, and they got there, and it was her wasn't but a couple of minutes before her husband was there. He had been worried sick all night long. Ministries different. And can I tell you that's not COVID related or pandemic related, it's just ministry. Sometimes the heart breaks, sometimes the hurt just walks right in on you and there you are having an experience that you've been in ministry your whole life and never had that one. Traveled around the world and never had that one. Jesus was having one of those days. Everybody's dressed, but he's having one of those days. You'll remember last week when we, I, I preached and set up the text and said, the text that I'm reading to you about right in the middle of it is the feeding of the 5,000. Well, we're in the feeding of the 5,000 this week. But remember, last week it was Jesus and the disciples were in these ministry moments and people were coming around and they were doing healings and they were doing miracles and Jesus was blessing them and people kept coming and the disciples were relaying the message to Jesus and saying, you're not going to believe what happened. This was such a great day or, or maybe it wasn't a great moment and they were saying that was tough, but they were having these great ministry conversations and Jesus said, let's get away. Let's get away. And they they were going to get away, and they were on their way. And then Jesus saw these people, and in his mind, in his heart, in his very soul, he saw them, and he went, they're like a sheep without a shepherd. And Mark said he was moved to compassion. And then he fed them. This is John's version of the story. A large crowd is following him. They've seen the signs, and Jesus goes up the mountain. He's there with the disciples. They're ready for the Passover. They're ready for this big, huge event. And yet Jesus keeps looking at the crowd who's hungry. He keeps looking at these lost sheep as the shepherd. The disciples see him doing it, and they're going, not just, not, no, Jay. Come on, Jay. Let's go. Not, no, come on. we got to go. And Jesus, he asked them a question. And John says he asked it to test them. He asked them the question, he said, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed them? And, and, and Philip, Philip speaks up, and one of the disciples, he speaks up and he says, if we had enough money, if we had enough money, we don't have enough money. There's not enough hours in the week. We can't work enough hours to get the wages, to get the money to feed all these people. And Publix isn't open anymore. Anyway, there's nothing we can do, Jesus. Send them on their way. There's nothing that we can be done. There's not enough money. There's not enough work. We can't do anything. And then, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says, there is a boy here. There is a boy here. For 20 years, I have preached this text, 
And I've gotten to this point, and I did what John O did this morning. I, I, I've used the illustration of saying, you know, Jesus tells us we've got to come into the world like a child. We've got to live like a child to inherit the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We've got to come as a child and experience like a child. And, and this story, the narrative of the children taking that little bit that they have and God blessing. But 18 months in, I'm reading it differently. Because I'm hearing that excuse, I'm hearing that word, I'm hearing that message of them saying, not enough money, Jesus. Not enough work, Jesus. And then Andrew's saying, well, there's a boy. Can you hear it? There's a boy. But he's only got a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish. And what is that going to do among so many? Do you, do you hear them? They're looking at Jesus. They're coming out of all this ministry. They're having all this ministry experience. And they're looking at Jesus and saying, there is nothing that we can do here. There is nothing that can be done. Jesus, let's go home. I get it, man. I can't tell you how many times I've quit over the last 18 months. I mean, I've, I've, I've gotten in the car, driven home, and said, that's going to be somebody else's job tomorrow. I'm done. You know, the, you know the second nastiest emails I've ever gotten in my ministry? Were last March when we closed the doors. You know the nastiest emails I've ever gotten? Was last October when we reopened. See, because here's what would happen. On Tuesday, you'd get an email saying, hey, we're in a pandemic. Can you speak more? Can you preach more? Can you talk more about the pandemic, please? We're in a pandemic. We need to know what our preacher thinks. On Wednesday, you'd get an email saying, Hey, can you quit talking about the pandemic, please? We know what's going on. Can you please just set it aside? And then a couple weeks later, you get an email saying, hey, listen, there's a lot going on in the world. We need to theologically know about all these issues, about all this crisis, about all this mess. Can you please speak to it? And then on Thursday, you get an email saying, look, CNN, can you quit talking about everything and just stick with Jesus and the Bible? It was hard. It, it, it was hard. And it was hard to stand in this room because what gets me through is you. This room was built for you. The altars were placed in place for you. The baptismal font for you. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit comes not for the font, not for the rail, not for the pews. The Holy Spirit comes for you and uses these instruments. The columns are not what's important. It's you. That Jesus Christ enters this space. Jesus Christ enters into our church, enters into our facility, enters into our halls for you. And it's tough. And it's awkward sometimes. And that's where Jesus is standing. And so he tests them. And he says, what do we do? Now, I need you to hear me. Jesus is not trying to see if they can develop a meal plan. Work with me for a second. Jesus is not trying to figure out if they can ration up the food to get it. He is saying to them, do you understand that you're standing in the presence of God Almighty? He's saying to them, do you understand that you are standing with the Son of God? John told us that Jesus was there from the very beginning, that the Word made flesh, that Jesus was there when the mountains was capped, the stars were placed, and the waters were told where to quit rolling. He's saying to them, he's speaking to them and saying, if we want to do this, I can do this. The question is not how in the world are we going to do it. It's a statement, guys, where you hit each other on the elbow and go, hey, watch this. Jay's fixing to feed everybody here. He's fixing to do a miracle. This is going to be awesome. I can't tell you how many times over 18 months I have forgotten that. Can you confess it with me? I don't mean raise your hand. I don't mean stand up. But just sitting here and just in your heart, can you, can you join with me in that and go, I have forgotten to? I have forgotten to that it's been about things and stuff and thoughts, and I have forgotten about faithfulness. I've forgotten just how great God is, just how awesome God is. Jesus is saying to the disciples, we can do this. I'm here. I can show you. I can do it. 
they gather up the fragments. And there's plenty of sandwiches to be made. They gather up the bread and the fish and it's just beautiful and amazing and wonderful. He couldn't just have a little bit left over. He couldn't have just enough and they give the last piece to the last person because that's not the way grace works. Grace is infinite. The provenient grace that traveled before and with and around fills, holds, carries. It would be very tempting for us to spend a lot of time and spend the majority of our time in what we've lost as a church. It's very frustrating to walk the halls and go, 16, 18 months ago, we were 1,000 people a week. The studies say we're going to come back around 350 a week. Most churches, the most denominations our size are going to be 30% in the beginning as you get rolling again. That's about where we are, about where we'll be. And if you stay there, you're standing with the disciples saying, Publix is closed, brothers and sisters. If we stay there focused on what we've lost and what we're facing and forgetting of who we're serving, can I offer a suggestion? There's empty seats here. Instead of focusing on the empty seats and being sad, let's focus on the opportunity of inviting someone else into the blessing. Let's view it as an opportunity to say, hey, there's room here for more. There's room for folks to experience the power, the grace, the glory of Jesus Christ and just watch and see what he does. I got a lot of emails after last week. I'm going to get some more after what I'm about to say. I will not spend the next 20 years fighting this denominational fight. I will not do it. I will not choose. I will not pick a side. And I will not let a side pick me. I won't do it. And here's one of the reasons why. Jocelyn Wallace, you have, well, some of you have met her, a couple of you have met her. The rest of you will meet her in a couple of weeks. She was a member of a former church of mine drowning in addiction. The way she would tell it was if there was a drug, she'd find it. If there was a drug, she'd get it. And she wouldn't take no for an answer. She lost everything, her house, her home, her family, her kids, her husband, her mom and dad for a season. She lost everyone and everything. We met with her Wednesday at the Never Alone Recovery Center that she now runs in Douglasville, Georgia. She said some things that just have haunted me, one of which was she talked about she hated going to church with her mom and daddy to my church, to our church. She hated going because she'd see her name on that long time, long term prayer list and it shamed her and embarrassed her. Looking back on it, she said she's grateful for it now, but it was so hard to see her name on that list. She also told this story that one of the times, do you hear me? One of the times that she got out of jail, one of the times, she got outside, got outside the final door and realized there was only one person in the world that she could call that would pick her up. Only one. So she called that person, her dealer. And her dealer picked her up and she was back in jail within a couple of weeks. Do you know who her pastor was at that point? Me. I'll never make that mistake again. See, what scripture tells us over and over and over and over is that when the world goes to hell is when God goes to work. That when the world's falling apart and everything looks hopeless, it's when God lays out and pours out miracles. And can you tell me where God will be shining most, most powerful? Is when Jocelyn walks out of jail and there's somebody there to make sure she doesn't have to call her dealer. She is a multiple felon. 
She can't get her own house. She has to have family help her get her house. And now the house that they have has four bedrooms in it, one for her, one for her daughter, who's now going to Kennesaw State, and two for people who are in recovery and need a place to stay. This never alone clubhouse that they have built and are now building and growing is a place for people where they can come and sit with their family. If they've got court ordered actions where they have to have supervised ministry, they can go there. She's building a life by serving others. It won't be always be pretty and it won't always be easy, but it'll always be spirit filled. I encourage you. Now I'm not inviting, I'm not asking Smyrna first to come with me. That's not going to be a ministry at Tillman House. This is something for me and Miss Porter to see, to experience, to watch God and to experience resurrection. Where are you seeing resurrection? Where are you seeing God show out? Where are you experiencing the power of God and transformation? Because in this season right here, right now, when people are so separated from church in ways they haven't been in over a hundred years, right here, right now, churches have the opportunity to teach people about the prevenient, life-altering, life-changing grace of Jesus Christ and change our world in ways we never have. So let me ask you, when Jesus does the miracle, are you ready to ask, how are we ever going to do this? Or are you ready to proclaim, hey, watch this. Next week, the screens will be out of the sanctuary. They didn't clap. The altar rails will be down, and for the first time, we will be bringing you to the altars to receive communion. Do you know what the next text is with Jesus? I am the bread of life. As he stands in chaos and controversy and hurt and struggle, he constantly reminds us, you can come to me and I will feed you. Let's learn. Let's serve together. And let's really experience the thanks and the gratitude of the Eucharist. Amen.